going on, guys? Welcome back to Sledgehammer Horror. I am Ken Sledge, and joining me today, the drummer from Coheed and Cambria, the starter of Weird Science, our favorite hip hop group. We got Josh Effort. Josh, how you doing today, man? Oh, I'm doing good, Ken. How are you, my friend? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for being on here. Glad to see the quarantine hasn't turned you into a werewolf yet. <laughs> Not yet, but maybe coming soon. <laughs> um, so we are talking about the first horror movie that you've ever seen, and your first first horror movie was. American Werewolf in London. Okay. And I do want to say this at the beginning. We are not talking about an American Werewolf in Paris. We oh, God, no. Werewolf. Yeah. So um, do you remember how old you were when you watched this movie for the first time? Yeah, well, that's kind of part of what's funny about it, dude, is that five, I was five years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, my upstairs neighbors, uh, really lovely people, but they would kind of watch the kids and it would be like me and my neighbor, Tori, and they had... Now, this is when VHS was all the rage, but there were laser discs. I think yeah. that's what it was. They were big. You had to turn them over in the middle of the movie. <laughs> they were maybe 10 by 10. They were big, giant. And they only, they had two movies. But this was supposed to be, like, technologically relevant. This was, like, you know, before CDs. So this was, like, awesome. And Mike, the stepdad, would always poke in, like, don't break the laser discs. But he only had two movies. He had Cat People and American Werewolf in London. Okay. So we would watch American Werewolf in London. I mean, seriously, I remember it as like every day or at least four times a week. And you know, when you're a kid, like you could just watch a movie over and over and over and over. And sure, 90% of the shit is going over my head, but maybe that's part of why it's become not just the first horror movie that really, that not just that I saw, but that really kind of landed because it kept landing over the years over the years you watch it at five okay you miss a lot of the stuff mm -hmm. but you love it there was boobies you think it's great there was some gore you're like this is this is the shit um then you watch it at 10 and maybe some of those jokes land now you yeah. watch it at 15 okay even more of it lands so it's always kind of like reinvented itself as i've changed to me and it remains a top five all-time movie to me i think american world in london is a really important piece of the horror tapestry uh that make up my taste it's a pillar of my horror taste and one of my favorite films and the practical effects in this movie uh, that's something we'll get touch on a little bit later on are perfectly executed um, yeah dude if you can imagine too when you're watching it like i take that transformation over any transformation i've ever seen and like uh the fact that it was done in the 70s it's just like oh my god dude like that's unbelievable i truly unbelievable although it's 80s i believe but it's to me, I think it looks better than any trans. A lot of people made a big fuss about the transformation scene in what was it called? It was a Netflix show, Hemlock Grove, Hemlock Drive. Have you ever heard of it? I have not. See, pretty short lived. It kind of had a buzz moment. And I said, oh, I got to see this. I watched the whole first season. And when the werewolf transformation scene happened, people were loving it. But I thought it was kind of underwhelming. There was one or two cool parts, but it was so digital. And maybe that's, you know, maybe I look for it to be like somewhat practical because of my love for American Werewolf in London. But come on, hand. man, that is the shit. It's perfect to me. That transformation is perfect. Well, when you see David's hand just start to elongate and he's, I'm hot, I'm hot and ripping the shirt. That's, it's, it's a scary scene for, we were watching it the other night with me and my wife. So I wanted to catch up on it. I haven't seen it in a couple of years. And we were watching it. And my daughter at that point was like, I'm out. Yeah. Like she took off. Yeah. Like, Fair enough. The yeah. are still real, you know. So that was that transformation scene is actually one of my favorite scenes in the whole movie. Sure, yeah, big time. I mean, it's, it was groundbreaking at the time too. I mean, um, you know, if I was a good fan, I know I for years I've known the makeup people that worked on that movie, but it escapes me right now. But that was revolutionary. That was groundbreaking. What what year did the movie come out? Was it what eighty or eighty one or something? I want to say it was eighty two. Yeah, early 80s, mm -hmm. and just changed the game, dude. What about the scene when it shows his whole body, and he's got the really thin midsection, but and the hair is growing, and uh, I love that. I love that. The hand is classic, though. Yeah. Oh, and the hand straight. As kids, <laughs> we always used to go like this. Oh, and make our hands stretch out. Yeah, because it was, you know, it was cool to a five-year-old kid. Horror movies didn't scare me as a kid. Like, I can remember – like staying up, my parents were going to watch Nightmare on Elm Street. It was the talk of all their friends. Okay. And I would stay up and 
and I'd watch it from my bedroom. I'd have my bedroom open just a crack, and I'd build a little contraption made out of crates and, and couch cushions so I could sit on top of it so I could see the movie over their heads. Ugh. And I loved it. Like, if it was on HBO, you know, this is pre-internet. Yeah. I'm dating my old ass, but if it was on, if Return of the Living Dead was on at 4.10 a.m. on HBO, you had to stay up till 4.10 to see it, and I would. And if I missed it, I'd throw a fit, throw a tantrum. But yeah. I, I don't really know the reason why. Like, horror just spoke to me, but I'm so no glad. I feel really, back then either. Yeah, well, I feel blessed that American Werewolf in London was the first horror movie that I saw. And I think it did really set the tone for me. Uh, in a lot of ways, I see pieces of like my own personality in that movie. Um, and yeah, I feel really blessed that that was the first one. Took my horror virginity. <laughs> Which scene, if you had to pick one scene in that whole movie that affected you the most? I know we were talking about the transformation scene, but if you had to pick the one scene you think that affected you the most, what would it be and why? Oh my God, dude. There's so many in that movie, though. Okay. As a kid, and it still kind of resonates now, right? Like it still reverberates through my adult life. When when Jack shows up in the hospital, okay, seeing him get absolutely torn to shreds was, you know, I don't want to say traumatic in a bad way. It was like traumatic, like I was glued to the TV, like. Oh. But when he, you know, presents himself to David in the hospital. Oh, oh my God. But dude, also the dream sequences, the music in those dream sequences where he's just, you know, David doesn't know what's happening to him yet. And he keeps having these dreams and chasing down the deer yeah. or like he, he's a demon. And maybe some of that makeup looks like somewhat dated now when he's the demon thing with the fangs. But those scenes are equally as important. It's impossible for me to pick one scene. And I, I love the way that. What's that? When they have that, when he's having the dream and all the werewolves and monsters come into the house, they're having the shootout where they're just shooting everybody. They got the oh, dude, the, the Nazi werewolves from yeah. another dimension. Do you know that John Landis like wrote a part two that centered all around that? Like it was about basically another plane of existence where werewolves were basically in World War Two, World War Two, and the studio was like. Get the fuck out of here, dude. There's <laughs> no way. And uh, that's, I just always wonder. I'd love to read that. I'm sure it's around online, and I just haven't, like, looked for it enough. But I love reading about that idea. That was so ill with the Muppets on TV. Yes. And they sliced it. Yes. So, it was disturbing. It was, what a movie. What a movie. Oh, my God. I'm going to watch it. As soon as we're done, I'm watching it tonight. Well, have you, do you have Shudder by any chance? Uh, you know, believe it or not, I don't. But isn't that funny that I don't have Shudder? It's insane to me. But I have so much shit to watch. Like, I'm not out of shit to watch by any means. I have so many movies to catch up on. That That's the only – but I, I have to get Shudder. But then I also – you know, how many streaming services do I have? I have every one other than Shudder. Well, the reason I'm asking is they have um, the old movie Creep Show and Creep Show. They have a TV series on Shudder, the Creep Show series. And there's one with Nazi werewolves. And it centers around one of the episodes centers oh, no around shit. Nazi werewolves. Yes. Really? So oh, if you can cool. check out the Creep Show, show it's a great show. Um, it has a lot of uh, horror icons that are in it. Like uh, the guy from uh, Saw is in it. Yeah, um, that's cool. I, I saw some ads for the show and whatnot. And I was like, oh, shit, I want to check that out. There's been like 10 different times where I'm like, oh, I got to get Shudder. Mm -hmm. um, I just like r right now, I'm like so many things to watch. My buddy Jeremy, uh, famous photographer Jeremy Saff, I'm not name dropping, he's a good friend of mine, but he gave me his voodoo password. And every time I open it, there's like 30 new movies in there. <laughs> he's literally thousands of movies in there. And I'm just like, beyond that, you know, we have every streaming service. And I think my wife will kill me if I add one more to it. That's the real reason why I don't have Shudder, because I don't want to fight with my wife about it. But um, I got to check out that creep show. Do they not make it available, like, on iTunes or anything? Like, you I'm have to have Shudder to see it? I'm about to make Shudder hate me, but I – the rumor is AMC bought rights to Creep Show, and they're going to be showing it on AMC. That would be dope. I kind of I, – I remember seeing the trailers for it and whatnot and kind of thought to myself, like, Oh, man, I want to see that. I will see that one at one point. But, yeah, I didn't rush out and get Shudder. But I still feel like I should. I'm a horror guy. Um, yeah, I will at some point for sure. Shudder original but, definitely worth it, man. It's, it's more yeah. like I'm a good job. I don't want to be a Shudder um, advertisement here. 
But um, you, how you, much are they paying you, Ken? <laughs> right. Uh, you did talk about how you do watch this movie quite often. Um, you have kids. Is this a movie that you've watched with your kids, or do you still think it's a little too much? No, they. You know. Yeah. Yes, it's too much. Um, they. Maggie, my stepdaughter, she's 16 years old now, and I've been around since she was three. And you know, when she was five, I tried to show her Star Wars. And we're maybe four minutes into the movie, and I hear next to me, and I look, and she's crying because Darth Vader scared her. <laughs> and I was like, oh, shit, you are definitely not my blood, because right. what the fuck? But now she's watched, like, I mean, I begged her my whole life to watch horror movies with me, and she went off to her friend's house and comes home and says, we watched it. And I was so brokenhearted because literally forever, I've been asking her whole life, I've been asking her to watch her whole conscious life, asking her to watch horror movies with me. And she doesn't care. But, you know, I'm lame. I used to be cool to her. Now I'm lame. And she's 16, so everything's lame. But, right. um, yeah, she's not. I never watched. And I gave up a, maybe a couple of years ago trying to get them to watch horror movies. They're not into them. Whatever. It's my thing. And maybe I'm glad. Maybe actually I'm secretly glad because – it would really piss me off if I showed her American Werewolf in London and she was like, yeah, that was all right. I'd be like giving her like, oh, I'd be yelling at her. No, you don't understand. We have to watch it again. I'd make her watch it again. But um, <laughs> Let me that's just a joke. Copy. Maybe then you'll understand if you watch it on Laserdisc. Yeah, you got to watch it on Laserdisc and flip it. Do you remember those? Well, you're I younger know. than me. These were, dude, hold, I got it. They were huge. Like the actual physical thing was enormous. And... I'm not sure. Like, it must have looked better than a VHS, but we're, dude, like, this big, yeah. giant. I can't, I can't even show you on the screen. They were that big. And halfway through, it would say on the screen, you have to flip it over you have to hit the button, take it out, turn it over, and put it back. It was crazy. And I think that was Laserdisc. I think that was a technology yeah. that was around then. It was considered, like, super high-end. God, they were probably mega expensive, and that's why – uh, Tori, my neighbor's dad, would probably always be like, don't break my discs or whatever, but <laughs> pretty sure they were laser discs. But yeah, it was that and Cat People. Mind you, we would watch Cat People too, but I just never dug it. I ne None of it really stuck. I should watch sure. that now as an adult. I bet like certain things will have a lot of nostalgia for me, but um, we all loved American Werewolf in London, me and all the neighborhood kids, and we would watch it all the time. All in fact, at camp one year, we used to go to this rec camp. I think I, I started when I was seven, but they would like take a vote on what movie to watch and me and enough kids, we got enough kids to vote for American werewolf in London. And it made it about 10 minutes into the movie before the camp counselor was like, Oh fuck no. And she turned it <laughs> off. It was like, I think when Jack is getting ripped up, she's like, no, 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 we can't have this. And um, pretty awesome. Uh, but yeah, a lot of the, we all loved that movie and it would be like the talk of the playground. And, but I was very young. I was five, five, six, seven, eight. I mean, all those years, watching it on Laserdisc and um I mean it's an important movie to me dude I mean it's like I don't have very many movie posters in my house but the first one that I hung up in my like kind of movie annex my I have like a little room that was the movie room now we've been working out in here but we got this original print of the American Werewolf in London oh, poster yeah. here um yeah it's an important movie to me you know we all have ones that kind of like build up taste and I think a lot of my taste can point back to that movie. It's fun. Does, it always pisses me off in horror movies when they give themselves so much credit for being scary. Like, they have to make the, the humor, like, slapsticky, silly, like, right after a scare. Like, don't give yourself so much credit. You're not scaring me. American Werewolf in London, all the humor felt so real to me. And it was funny. It was a funny movie. But it was also very romantic and deeply sad. Uh, I mean, it's about love. He falls in love with her. What about the scene where he's going to commit suicide when he's in the phone booth? Yeah, that's right. a heavy scene. Yeah, you feel that. You feel that scene. You, that's another thing I was going to bring up to you is with this movie, it's not just a horror movie. You've got elements of romance. You've got elements of comedy. This is a perfect movie. This, to me, is the horror version of Back to the Future. Um, yeah, dude. That's that awesome. Awesome yeah. description. And I dig it 100% what you're saying. Yeah, it's got everything, but it's got, to me, in my opinion, art is always subjective. So I don't, you know, or perspective-based. I don't want to say it's not like my opinion matters more than anybody else. But to me, it does them all well. It's yeah. not just that it does them and tries to throw 
everything into this, make a blender of insane, you know, all these different genres. It does it all well. The comedy lands. I believe Jack and David care about each other. I believe that David cares about Nurse House. It's just, there's so much right in the movie. Um, and that's why it's one of my favorites. But God, I, I couldn't, I don't even know if like, if somebody told me that they didn't like that movie, like how it would even register for me. I don't think I've ever met anyone that straight up doesn't like the movie. It's just such a good piece of art. I just, I love it so much. And going back and rewatching it now, like I, said, I haven't seen it in a long time. So I rewatched it with my wife and the influence this movie has, even certain scenes that have almost been completely mimicked can't be understated. And you're talking about comedy and not being slapsticky. You look at the opening scene when they're walking down the road and they make it to the bar and how funny that scene actually is. Or when yeah. he's, David's cussing out the cops in the square trying to get arrested. You, it's genuinely funny, but you feel like they're not trying too hard to be funny. They're- yeah, and you know, what John, like he had done Animal House already because on the poster it says uh, a different kind of animal. So he was known in the comedy realm and comedy's not easy. I mean, we've all seen it done bad, you know? Uh, it's not easy to be done right. There's a lot of funny moments when he wakes up in the zoo when he steals the balloon from the British boy, and he's like, <laughs> and the naked American man just took my balloon. It's, but there's always this brooding, dark, oh my God, dude, for the rest of my life, I'll hear that sound. When has a werewolf ever sounded like that before? It wasn't, oh, it was, it must- and it was horrifying, dude. Yeah. It was horrifying, and I love that. I fucking love it, dude. This oh, you get me? This movie does the little, like you said, while we're on that subject, it does the little things right. Another thing that I, I, love, I think so. Another thing I love that you don't see very often is every time you see Jack after he's been killed, he decomposes a little bit more. Every yeah, time dude. That decomposition is taken in more. And I think that's awesome. He's not just some ghost that's standing there. It's almost as if he's a corpse that's walking. He tells him, I'm here. I'm stuck here because you killed me and you're a werewolf. Or I was killed by a werewolf. Now we got to stop the last werewolf. So it's yeah. almost like he's just, you're watching this corpse decompose the whole time, not just a ghost following you around. And I can really appreciate that now that I'm older. All the makeup effects it took to do that, the practical effects, that's a great way to go with that the whole aspect of this movie. Absolutely, Ken. I mean, you hit the nail on the head, dude. Jack, as he rots, you know, it resonates with you. Jack's a funny guy. These guys love each other. These guys are best friends traveling Europe together. He's begging David to take his life. And what's the one scene where he's, oh, God damn it, David. Oh, dude, it just resonates for me. (laughs) I carry with it all that nostalgia. So there's all these years of buildup tied in, like, of my own life, watching it over the years. And it just, the perfect mixture of a powerful piece of art and then my own kind of nostalgia-driven experience with it creates the perfect viewing experience i mean i'm for sure i watch it probably i i think i said but we did we were talking before the interview and i said once every two months but you know sometimes six months will go by and i don't watch it but then i'll watch it twice in the next six months so <laughs> on average i'm not sure but i am a hundred percent gonna watch it tonight and i'm really looking forward to it and i just i love it i mean it's a really i cry at the movie dude at the end when when the wolf's eyes soften and you know, you think like, oh my God, is love, as stupid as it's, is love stronger than the curse of the wolf? And you no, it's might not. Have curse. Yeah, well, and then what happened? Like, the, okay, so the wolf's eyes soften. Do you remember? Like, yep. oh yeah. David, and the, the eyes soften, but then no, the curse is too strong. Yeah. Ah, and then the cops shoot him. And then he's laying there naked. Yes. That's the end. Perfect yes. ending. Yes. People. People need endings that are happy. I love when I get into like a YouTube comment right, where people are like, endings suck though. Like what? Endings to me are supposed to be powerful to leave you with something. Like it doesn't have to be happy and tied up in a box. It was deeply sad. And then the song that comes in, that's a thread in the movie where they play with that energy of, you know, incredibly sad, incredibly realistic and dark. And then this really kind of happy music comes yeah. on. And I love that about that movie. And I, like, I, like I said before, the podcast, when we were just talking, that's a theme that you can see show up in every 
musical project I've ever been a part of, whether it be Weird Science or Coheed. Uh, I know Claudio's a big fan of that as well, that kind of juxtaposition, playing with that energy. And that movie does it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's it. It's perfect. You know, hats off to, to everyone who worked on that movie, but particularly Landis and God, I so wish they made that part too. I mean, it sounds fucking out. Oh, dude. I it would, sounds it, so it, out. It'd be so cool. Yeah. Werewolf, werewolves in World War II, but God, they, yeah, that scene, every scene is important. Every scene is amazing to me. I just, even as a kid, the little kid that keeps going, no, like he was really cute <laughs> to me and I liked that kid for some reason. As a kid, I was like, I like that kid. That kid's all right. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, like I love Nurse Earth. Alex. When, when Nurse Alex is talking to him after he keeps saying no, she's like, have you ever been struck in the face and neck? <laughs> I, I, I just, that. Yeah, it's the perfect uh, perfect movie to me, man. I'm, um, I'm really happy that we get a chance to talk about it because it's not hard to convince me to talk about American Werewolf in London for long periods of time. It's just such a powerful movie. But um, All right, so what's the next question? We'll keep going. I was actually going to ask you about the depressing ending, but when you think about this movie, <laughs> what, is, what is the first thing that pops in your head when someone brings up American Werewolf in London? What's the first thing that just absolutely pops into your brain? I mean, you, romance is honestly, because I've had so many long conversations about it, and I always bring up the romantic element. Now, I know that that's not the main thread in the movie, but that is, maybe it's just one that resonated with me the most. And Maybe that's a byproduct of having these talks where I'm trying to convince people like, no, Amer picture people that have never seen it. American yeah. Werewolf in London. Like, no, it's really a romance movie. So that, <laughs> but that is what, dude, I loved Nurse Alex as a kid. Like I thought about her all the time. I'm positive the first time I jerked off was thinking of her. You know, I loved her, dude. I loved her for years. And like, I wanted their love to work. It killed me when the wolf just still came out and that love couldn't defeat, right. you know, the curse of the uh, Lincoln throw, or whatever you say. But, um, yeah, that's really the – it does, kind of doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I'm trying to, like, rationalize it. or uh, But, yeah, romance is the first thing that comes up. Um, but you're talking about a lifetime of feelings, a lifetime of ideas that kind of wrap around American Werewolf in London. But – yeah, I think that's a fair answer, dude. I, uh, and I stand by it, as strange as it is. Romance is the first thing that comes up for me. Yeah, I, it's funny because when you, when you rewatch this movie now, because that's something that, like I said, we watched it, and there's so many different elements of love in this movie. Like you said, it's not just him and the nurse. I mean, even the doctor, when he's trying to come down, he obviously loves them so much because he's trying to help David. And then you got... Um, well, David and David and Jack, like, there's so much love there. Yeah, it's about how, you know, I mean, it's the perfect, like, kind of the villain is something that's not, you know, it's not necessarily another person. It is this person you love. It's the greatest setup. But we've seen this mishandled so many times because I, I believe one of your questions was, what do I think of American Werewolf in Paris? And, that dude, yeah. that movie is, it just broke my heart. I mean, you know... I went to see it on Christmas Day, and we sat there stunned after the movie played. Stunned in, like, disbelief of how much we didn't like it. And my friend Pat goes, <laughs> yeah, I love him. He goes, that movie just ruined my Christmas. And I was like, that, that's pretty perfect. I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan. I've given it a ch many chances over the years, too. I, I think to myself, this can't be as bad as I remember. And then I watch it, and they just... I don't know. I also don't blame the makers, dude. I, I do think there were probably some ideas that set, like looked great on paper. Um, the over-reliance on CGI that was outdated two months after it came out is a real bummer for a movie that the original is like, you know, kind of like the trademark practical effects for the time, you know, like a real pillar of that, what they were capable of. And then you have this like very cartoony, very video game looking wolves and just a letdown from top to bottom in my eyes. I'm really not a fan. And, you know, I'm waiting for the day that they remake because American World in Paris is not a remake of American World in London. It's not, it's technically a sequel. I mean, yeah, that does um, but I'm waiting for them to remake American World in London. And I always have high hopes though, dude, I'm a horror fan. And it's like, I, 
of course I get a little bit like, oh God, come up with an original idea. Because for every remake, like I, I'm afraid that that's one less original idea that doesn't get the green light. I mean, think about the 80s, dude. Ghost, all these things that got huge. Ghostbusters comes to mind. I feel like an idea like that might not, might not get made today, at least not by a big studio and get a big push and all that. But, um, you know, just like in music, the creative realm with movies is always changing. And I understand business-wise why it makes sense to remake movies. So I know they'll end up remaking it. And I'll still hold out hope that it's really good. I don't think a remake means that it's automatically bad. I think there's been a couple that have been good. Um, and I'll hold out hope that that'll be good. But I know it's coming one day. They will remake it for sure. It has a built-in name, and that's what they care about is brand recognition. So um, – We'll see. But yeah, American Wolf in Paris was just an enormous letdown. And now it's been a, an incredibly long time where we haven't had anything in that realm. But um, that's why I expect a remake. Like, and I don't, it's not like American Wolf in London is like some giant, well, known, you know, they're looking to hit young people. They want, yeah. what, 18 to 24 year olds. Like we're already out of the major, uh, <laughs> or maybe it's 18 to 40, but I'm above 40 now. I am 40, but I'm finding myself not part of like the, targeted realm for right. media which is a different it's kind of strange but um i still think they'll remake it just because it has a brand recognition but yeah we'll see american world from paris though not my shit not all see, it's funny because when you talk about a remake and how a remake can be good i love a couple of the remakes that have come out recently i loved halloween 2018 i was a big fan of the friday the 13th yep. remake me too. Oh, hey, Ken, me too. I thought the Friday the 13th remake is fucking solid, dude. Yeah. And it doesn't get the love that it deserves. It made damn close to $100 million. It was ultra successful. These assholes got to figure out the rights and give the fans a movie, dude. Like, every year there's a fan that loses their life or, or, or dies of old age at this point that doesn't get another movie. Figure out the legal shit and let's make another movie. There's a built-in audience. We're ready to spend money. We love it. Give us the fucking movie. I can't believe they've held it up for this long. It's funny you say that because I just recently did a ranking where I ranked all 31 of the Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, and Halloween movies from 31 to 1. And I actually had Jason Goes to Hell as number 14, which I know is not a very great movie. But dude, at the end of that movie, when Freddy's glove came up and took Jason's mask down to hell, I talked about that for months. Like my family was finally like, Stop talking about this fucking movie. And then yeah, I had to dude. wait 10 I mean, years for Freddy vs. Jason. And I love Freddy vs. Jason. I know a lot of people shit on that, but man. I mean, it just did, it did not age well, dude, Freddy vs. Jason, because I loved it too, dude. Like, there was an article in some magazine where the opening line is, want to get on Coheed and Cambria's bad side? Talk shit about Freddy vs. Jason. <laughs> Josh, Josh Eppard will go in on you. And I was like, that movie's amazing. But it has not aged well. But uh, I loved it too, dude. I loved it. And then, you know, first of all, you won't find a bigger fan of Jason Goes to Hell than old Josh Shepard. I love that movie. Um, I have a very specific set of circumstances that led to my love of that movie. And I do understand why people don't love it. But put it this way. Put it this way. Me and the Coheed guys... And some of the crew on that summer tour did a Jason marathon where every night we watched a Jason movie. And when you watch them all in a row and then you get to nine, it is so clear the whole scope of the movie has been widened so immensely that I have to appreciate it. What was, the, what was New Line going to do? Make another movie? in the? I mean, they've seen the movie. Paramount was already trying to change things up with Jason Goes to Manhattan. Yep. I think New Line, the biggest fuck up was you know they didn't have to take jason out of the movie but check it out adam marcus director of jason goes to hell has a, a documentary coming out about the making of jason goes to hell this kid had never made a movie he made a music video and sean cunningham producer of the first friday the 13th and jason goes remember that was the tagline from the producer of the first yes. comes the last sean cunningham told adam marcus get that damn mask out of my movie. And he was basically forced to do that. So actually, I think he found an awesome way to keep yeah. Jason in the movie. And dude, Jason looked like, okay, maybe by today's standards, it's a little makeup-y, but oh my God, that was fucking 
dope at the time, dude. And like those scenes, like, uh, oh man, when he when, when he's at Jason's sister's house and he, he's the cop and he and she gets stabbed and she goes down and he looks up in the mirror and it's Jason just lurking. Yes. That shit is powerful, dude. And then Jason's ultimate return. Do you know how many people I've argued with about Jason Goes to Hell who don't even know? They, they're arguing how much the movie sucks and they don't even know that Jason returns at the end. They don't even know that. That's happened like three or four times where I'm like, well, he comes back at the end and they're like, oh, well, oh you mean the Freddy Glove thing? I'm like, no, dude, he's reborn. That scene is awesome when Creighton Duke is like, or Stephen asks Duke, Duke, does that thing, does the woman need to be alive for blah, 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 for, for a boy he's to be re- reborn? <laughs> no. Oh, God. And then Just smashed it. Dude, that was fucking awesome, man. Like, it was creative. Yeah, it was comic booky. Because I'll tell you what, dude, I prefer not human Jason. Give me six, seven, and uh, yeah, eight and nine. They're not, nine is one of my favorites, but eight isn't one of my favorite movies. But I like, Zombie, undead, powerful, unkillable Jason. That's now I love four, part, part six, man. When they when they yeah, zombify him to bring him back, and that's that's part one thing I brought up in when I did this ranking was this is no longer Mama's boy Jason. This is zombie. Yeah. I'm gonna fuck you up, Jason. That's well, it's it. like Tom, yeah, it's like Tommy says when he goes into the Forest Green Police Department. He's like. Jason's back, and he's more powerful than ever. <laughs> I mean, my hair stood up when he's when I first saw that as a kid. You know, I was young, and for, you know, at my house, you know, my dad was a musician, my mom was a musician, all their friends were like hippies. There'd be a lot of kids there of all ages, and all the older kids were heading out to the movies to go see Friday the 13th Part 6, and I was crying, literally crying, begging my parents to let me go. But my parents were like, you're, not, you're seven, get the few not fucking going. <laughs> Much love to my dad, though, who literally two years later took me and all my neighborhood friends to go see, like, Nightmare 3. So they came around pretty quick. But, yeah, at seven years old, they were not letting me go with a bunch of teenagers to see it. But I already loved those movies by that point. While American Werewolf in London was the first horror movie I saw, it wasn't long after that that I was fully immersed in the world of horror. Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th. I mean, movies like Nail Gun Massacre. My, me and my dad would watch together that are just like a ridiculous straight to VHS horror movie, okay. but you know, phantasm, I, you know, the list goes, the oh, raw head Rex, the list goes on and on and on and on. But I loved horror. In fact, dude, I didn't realize till I was like, thir- this is ridiculous. I didn't realize till I was like 13 or 14 that movies that weren't horror could be cool. I thought now, now this version of, I love all movies. I but- like, if it's good, it's good. I love dramas, certainly love documentaries. But when I, Josh is a kid, if it wasn't Led Zeppelin, I didn't want to hear it. And if it wasn't horror, I wasn't watching. I basically thought every non horror movie meant boring, not fun. Like, I, I thought every one of them was like the piano. I thought every one of them was this long winded, blah, blah, you know, bullshit. And then I went to go see Wes Craven's New Nightmare. And it wasn't playing anymore. I'd already seen it eight times. And I didn't like it. I didn't. I think it was over my head. I like, I'm not a fan of it now, really, honestly. I I know people love it. It was ahead of its time. But Wes kept saying that we were going back to dark, dark, dark Freddy. And I just didn't think it was all that dark. But I went to see it in the movies eight times. And on the ninth time, it wasn't playing anymore. But what was playing was Pulp Fiction. And begrudgingly, I went into the theater like, fine. And that day I learned, oh. Movies that aren't horror can also be cool and right. completely engaging. And then my whole world changed. Then I watched Goodfellas and The Godfather, you know, all these other movies. And my whole world opened up. But maybe that's what being a kid is for. But when I was a kid, it was horror or nothing, dude. I didn't want to watch it if it wasn't horror. Except for maybe a few comedies. But, like, if it wasn't horror, I wasn't fucking with it at all. For me, that was Casino. Man, the first time I seen Casino and Joe Pesci stabbed the dude with the pen, I was like, this is fucking awesome. God, Casino is so good, dude. It's Casino good. is so fucking good. I have that poster on my wall too. I just um, love how during that scene, how he's like, "You guys hear? You guys hear a little bitch? Where's the, the big tough guy that told my friend to shove a pen up his ass?" It's like, like to see Joe Pesci. And when I seen that movie, to me, Joe Pesci was Harry or uh, yeah, Harry from Home Alone. So I'm like, "Damn, Harry." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Vulcan, but you just stabbed this dude in the neck with a pen. Yeah, dude, I love Pesci, man. I love Pesci. Oh, dude. 
Um, another question I do have for you, well, back on American Werewolf. Sorry, I'm having a great time talking about everything else. But I know, we're going all over the place, but that's cool, whatever. Yeah, I love it. Um, if you had to choose your favorite kill in this movie, what would your favorite kill be? Well, that was, you know, that's an odd question because it's not like a real crazy body count movie. You know, a lot of times the deaths are left to the imagination. So I'd really have to say Jack's kill by the other werewolf, yeah. the one that scratches David. Um, that really scarred me in a good way as a kid. Yeah. Like that was, you know, whereas other kids might have been like, oh my God, not us Kingston kids. We were all like, what? You know, it's glued to the TV. But when they show his body, just ripped, just yeah. shreds, just a, a pile of gook and mess. I mean, that's the one. But then also, because of what it gives us, Jack's rotting corpse throughout the rest of the movie that you brought up. And I love that, how he continued. Till he's just basically rotten, green, disgusting. Yeah, green, nothing. He's a zombie almost at this point. His face is almost completely gone. You got the teeth. But it looks, it looks good. It doesn't look corny. It doesn't look... It just looks really good when he's still like that. So I, I, I think it looks tremendous. Yeah, I think yeah. it looks amazing. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm thinking now it's like Jack deteriorates along with David's mental state. You know, you could make a case that there is no wolf, right? Like that David was just going crazy and yeah. thinking that he was the wolf. Like, um, I don't – whatever. But, you know, Jack is, is deteriorating, rotting, and becoming – uh, you know, just like basically disintegrating before our eyes, along with David's mentor. Because remember, David at first he's like, "I feel amazing," blah blah yeah. blah. You know, as the wolf blood makes its way through him, and then as David realizes what he is, he watches his friend rot, rot, and he he begs Jack to go away. It hurts him to see. Please go away. Yeah. Please. Oh, it's deep, dude. This shit makes me cry. Like but when I watch it against the the wall, and he's trying to call for the nurse, and he's so scared and anxious. Yeah, and hurt. I I feel you because. That part, while we're in that scene, right before that, when you had the dream sequence of him killing the deer, that's the one when I was a kid that really got me. When you got the oh, word, Ken, the deer. me too. That might be up there too, because that scene, the music too, the I love the music. I just love that movie so much. I'm so passionate about how much I love this movie. Um, but bringing up a kill. You know, it's like if we were talking about Jason Goes to Hell, my favorite kill, without a doubt, is the NC-17 version. Uh, the camper where she's orgasming, pull through her, and then splits her in half. Oddly enough, not in the R version. You've ever seen the R version? Uh, the pole goes through the girl, and that's the end of the scene. See, which I, is, I, that, it's funny to say because I do know exactly what you're talking about because right through the tent, right up through her, but I've never seen the R version, I guess, because I've, I've always seen her get ripped in half, and it always reminded me of the T-1000. At the end, of the <laughs> dude, totally. In fact, as a kid, I paused it. She's already split in half if you pause it. But you, I, you know, that's how obsessed with these movies I was. I'd pause it, find on a VCR, mind you, and I finally got it perfect. And she's already split in half, but it happened so fast. So, dude, my first. But people that went to the movies to see that movie didn't sure. see her split in half. Just adding more fuel to why people didn't like the movie. Why would the MPAA cut that out? Like, it's a horror movie. That's an awesome scene, dude. That was brutal. The kills in Jason movies are oftentimes, like, really boring, dude. Like, they're not, like, always awesome. Nine introduced. Now, eight gave us Julius's head getting popped off. That was dope. Um, and, you know, four has when uh, Tommy puts the machete in his head and he falls. And Tom Savini did that. And it was yeah. awesome. But... By and large, like a majority of the kills are pretty boring. Nine gave us, I thought, a lot of great kills. Even like when uh, Jason, as a, the essence, the demon, possesses Robert, and the the, the heavy cook from the from the diner comes out and punches him, and he grabs the arm and rips the bone out. The bone, yeah, that right there was iller than most of the kills in the Jason realm. Nine did so much right, dude. We could have a whole other podcast talking about Nine. But that documentary that's coming out by Adam Marcus, I'm friends with him on Twitter. We're friendly enough on Twitter that he answers me sometimes. But that guy's a real hero to me. I'm always bombarding him like, hey, when's that documentary coming right. out? But they're working on it, and I'll be the first in line to see it. I cannot wait to see it. Um, they have my 10 bucks or whatever it costs. Like, I can't wait to see it. Um, if but, we're talking about J Jason kills, man, I still got to go with the sleeping bag kill. When he takes the girl in the sleeping bag and slams her against that, 
I sure, agree. I guess that's an all right kill. Yeah, I mean, everybody's, it's, yeah, it was cool. I mean, if you're going to tell me that that's cooler than the chick in the middle of an orgasm getting a pole through her chest <laughs> and then split in half, uh, it is pretty, oh, I'm not going to front. The sleeping back kill is dope. And it's a classic and yeah. it, it is for a reason. That was in Seven, right? Yeah. Um, Seven's one of my favorites. The director of Seven has come out and said, like, like a lot of those kills are cut to pieces. Yes. And then see, seeing what happened in Nine gives you an idea of just what the – but who works at the MPAA and is like, man, we can't, just can't have violence in this violent movie. People that don't like violence aren't going to see these movies. Like, right. who are you protecting? This is insanity. Like, we're going to see a movie about an undead killer killing people. Like, we can't possibly have blood. And it's insane. But it was either five or seven. One of them, the MPA cut so bad that it just, the director said it almost ruined the movie. That's seven. He's come out and talked about it openly. And uh, unfortunately, Paramount has lost a lot of the archival footage. They found some, like, on that box set, uh, his name was Jason uh, box set. They put some of it in, but it's all grainy and fucked up looking. Right. Um, but like hearing him describe what they filmed, it's like, oh man, they ripped this movie to shreds. And clear, Jason looked so dope. And so, I mean, Kane Hodder's first time playing yep. Jason. And I love what CJ Graham did in six. I love the kind of just dead silent tool belt reintroduction of Jason after five was Roy yep. and whatnot. But Kane obviously changed the game and brought so much. But there's nothing cooler than when Jason comes out of the water and he's so rotten that you can see his whole yes. – uh, all his bones in the back. Here, dude, I hate to keep getting up and running to my movie room, but oh, I, have a, I have a bust from, uh, from uh, Friday the 13th Part 7 made by – there's a, a fella in Canada, really, 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 really awesome guy. And somebody I've become quite good friends with, and he makes these busts. Um, he does all kinds of shit. Here, check this out. Look at this uh, from Freddy uh, from Nightmare on Elm Street uh-huh. Two, when when it's coming out of Mark's hand. But yeah. then check out this uh, Friday Seven bust here. Oh, dude, Pretty cool. Awesome. And then I got a nine over here. Check this, dude. You'll love this. We don't really know what Jason's face looks like in nine, right? Yeah. So he took he took it upon himself to kind of, you know, see where they would maybe oh, go. Oh, no way. Fucking awesome. Man. Isn't that dope, dude? dude? Isn't that so sick? Yeah, this shit's all in my movie room. I got this eight bust over here. And then I got all the masks behind me, all the Jason masks taken yes. off back here. And then uh, I have the it balloon here and then all the masks down here. I have a lot of Jason stuff, but not like some people. Some people's shit is out of control. But um, that's just how much I love nine, though. And seven. To me, Jason never looks cooler than seven and nine. And uh, those are the only two big busts that I have, seven and nine, because they were, I don't know, that, like, important to me. And I thought they were that cool. And, uh, you know, they'll forever be. Dude, if I ever hit the lottery, I'd make a new Jason movie. I'd walk in to the people fighting. I'd say, listen, everybody stands to make millions, you greedy bastards. You can have all the money. I'm going to write the movie. But it would be undead Jason. I I want comic book undead Jason zombified, unkillable Jason. Um, because we already had a remake with, and it wouldn't be a, a remake. I would make a straight sequel. Which there's a chance of that. What balls they had with Halloween to make a straight up sequel. And they paid off. It was a humongous hit. And- on everything, which I love. I love that they retconned everything because I've always been very critical of the Halloween series just because of how inconsistent it was. Um, well, yeah, like, elaborate on that. Like, what, what inconsistencies? Um, it really shit the bed, but what do you mean? Like, uh, if you could, please, how, elaborate. Well, how they killed off Laurie Strode. And, yeah, yeah. You know, and then brought her back and then killed her off. Um, I've never been – one of my favorites in the Halloween series, actually, is Halloween 3. Uh, I love Season of the Witch. I'm a huge fan of it. And I just recently found out that when they wrote the Halloween series, they were actually going to be anthologies. Yeah, different movie every time. Yeah, right? I I had just heard that relatively recently too, which is it's an interesting concept. Yeah. Um. Yeah, season of the witch is a great standalone oh, movie. Man. I love it too, dude. It's classic. It's funny. Um, if I was gonna remake a movie, that's what I would do, and I wouldn't call it Halloween Three. I would just remake it as Season of the Witch and make it a standalone movie. I think that that could have been a huge movie. Unfortunately, having the name Halloween on that movie, I think kind of ruined what that movie could have been. 
because totally dude totally they should play. yeah totally but like in now looking back with armed with the knowledge of they were trying to have a franchise where it would be something different every time it just didn't work that way you already got one and two perhaps if it was halloween two right. season of the witch and then halloween three was halloween three goblins in the bathroom whatever the fuck it would be but you know you'd already cemented michael myers as this right. character you know but um I did. I got to tell you, a lot of people don't, but I do. I like Halloween 4 a lot. I think Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers, is a good slasher, awesome movie. Introduced us to Jamie. But yeah, this is, it's the beginning of the end. I, I love 4. Now, 5, I could take it or leave it. It's not my favorite, but um, it's re that's really where we start going with all the, you know, the man in the black boots and the black hat and all this shit. Then they've got to over-explain everything. We had the explanation. Michael Myers was the embodiment of evil. Behind, there was nothing in those eyes but pain and misery and evil. But then they got to go and explain. And the explanation is fucking stupid. It's like ridiculous. And yeah, it really went. So I love that they said, yeah, not, and I, I, it sucks for Jamie because I loved her character. I thought she was awesome in four. I thought she was great in five. The character, the actress, I thought she killed it. I, five in general, take or leave, but I thought she was great in five. Um, it's a shame that they retconned uh, her. Oh, shit, did you lose me for a second? Sorry. For a um, second, but you're good. It's like, I'm bummed for her, the actress, but I love that they did that. And they said, you know what? None of that shit happened. This yeah. is a sequel to the original. Let's go. And, I fucking, and they're being rewarded for it. It actually gives us hope that there could maybe be a Friday the 13th, not remake, right. sequel. Like, give us a sequel. One through fucking nine have, 10 even happened. That shit's in the future, whatever. 10 can happen in the future. Give us a sequel where I just, I'd be so thrilled. I liked about that about the 09 remake, that it kind of encompassed one through four. Yeah. That it was like, yeah, I thought that was dope. And they did a good job. The Texas Chainsaw remake was good. The first one with Jessica Biel was really good, I thought. Um, Hills Have Eyes remake I thought was really good. Um, that might be about it as far as the remakes that I thought were good. Maybe I'm missing one, but um, I did not like the Nightmare on Elm Street remake. And it wasn't so funny. For me, it wasn't Freddy. Freddy, I could have, ta I guess, taken it or leave it. It wasn't the end of the world to me. I liked the darker kind of southern draw. This ain't gonna hurt one yeah. bit. I was like, oh, they went somewhere different with it. I'm cool. I just... I don't know, something, and I've watched it many times. I keep giving it chances. Something doesn't jive with me about it. Like, something about the actors and the story, I swear, they were going to make Freddy actually innocent. And then, like, halfway through shooting, they were like, wait, we can't do that. We have to flip the script. Something feels disingenuous about it to me, and it just didn't come off. It didn't work to me. But Friday remake, I actually did really like. I liked it a lot. The, the two things that really bothered me about the new Nightmare movie was one, I didn't believe Nancy. And Nancy's one of my favorite final girls of all time. Of and all two, time, dude. Yeah. yeah. I don't like that they made Freddy a uh, pedophile. I, I don't know. That, that's something that's always bothered me. It was kind of insinuated, I guess, in the older ones. But in the older ones, he was a child killer. You know, he wasn't. It did, when Nancy in the new one's like, fuck you. He's like, ooh, that sounds like fun. And he's licking her face. Like, I just, I couldn't do it. You yeah, know? that is a little fucked up. But I think it. Yeah, you bring up a good point, though, Ken, because, like, it, 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 I guess it could be insinuated, but no, he was a child killer. Yeah. They never made mention, I mean, which is awful. How funny is that? That Freddy is a child killer murdered who comes back and kills kids, and he, now he's selling you Pepsi and Doritos and shit. Right. Like, ha, 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 ha. That's fucking hysterical. <laughs> and may, possibly very American, which is scary right. also. But, um... Yeah, uh, you know, my take on it is my job's not to like Freddy. And if they want to make him as dark and fucking hateable as possible, I'm, I'm okay with that. I just, that movie missed for every, I dig what you're saying though. And I get, I understand it completely. That is creepy. That's fucking, ugh. like, I don't, you know, but God, you're supposed to hate Freddy. He's supposed to be awful. I mean, right. um, you know, it just didn't go that way, which is the whole story of Freddy is so wild. Yeah. Child killer. just like torturing kids and killing yeah. kids. Let's get that guy to sell stuff for us. People <laughs> love him. But we did. I loved him, dude. Everybody loved him. It was 
It was great. The like dark Freddy from from Nightmare One and Two, and I know Two carries with it like its own very unique kind of brand of sure. horror. But but Freddy in One and Two was so dark. You know the jokes weren't re- now everyone's favorite, and I'm, I'm I fall on the, the same camp as this. One and Three are my favorites. Um, but three is where the jokes really start. You think about like what's funny to Freddie in part one. Hey, Tina. And he just chops his fingers off and starts yeah. laughing. Like that's a Freddie. T- or he lifts his shirt and just cuts himself and ooze comes out. And he's like, <laughs> you know, that, or obviously in two, you've got the body. I've got the brain rips his fucking head. Off. That was what was funny to Freddie. In three, it did get, but it was great. It was great. What's what's the matter, Joey? Feeling tongue-tied? <laughs> you know, it's like, this is the beginning of the jokes going way over the yeah. top. And people loved it. I loved it, dude. We watched three. My dad, I think, told me it was the best movie he ever saw. He loved, we loved it. Imagine my father walking into a movie theater with a troop of, like, we must have looked like the UN, too. We got, like, white kids, black kids, Asian kids, all the neighborhood kids. We grew up in a neighborhood with everybody. My yeah. dad walks in with a troop of, like, ten of us. A bunch of like ten year old kids. We all get popcorn and we watch the movie. The people there must have thought my dad was fucking insane. Though. Right. Um, he all my dad asked is that like your parents said it was okay, and as long as like their parents said it was okay, my dad was tr- trucking us all to the movies, and he went in with us so we could watch the movie. But um, yeah, I love Nightmare Three, but it is the beginning of like the jokes and stuff. But Freddy's a really interesting like case study in american pop culture and whatnot oh sure um right it's like totally interesting but um well, god we could probably talk think, forever about this i think nightmare on elm street one is the most iconic horror movie when it comes to everything that you've gotten from that you know you got this is god you got him walking down oh, the yeah. with his hands you got the phone i'm your boyfriend now nancy you got the waterbed scene one two freddy's coming for you Everybody knows, yeah. Every, you know, from Nightmare One, and to me, the only thing that comes from maybe the Halloween theme is something more iconic. But Nightmare is when I think of horror, that's my first go-to. That's the first horror movie that I can remember really scaring me. Um, like, did Freddy? Know, Freddy you scared you as a kid? You were like, kidding. yeah. God, I'm jealous. Like, dude, like I wish that I I wasn't. I was enthralled. You know, I was like, like. Not not scared where I was like, this doesn't scare me like a ton. No, I was like just mesmerized yeah. by it. Because it wasn't like, well, this doesn't scare me. No, motherfucker, I slept with the lights on until I was like 15 because I was afraid. <laughs> like, but it, I don't know, I was just completely enthralled and interested and right. just overwhelmed with interest. You know, so interested in it that that like took, maybe that's a better way of saying it, that took over the fear, my interest. Like nothing could outweigh my interest in it. Um, and seeing, looking back now as an adult, like my dad's friends were like calling him, like, you've got to see this movie, Nightmare on Elm Street. It just took everybody by storm, this cheap little, what was the name of the production company? Like smart egg pictures. And then new line had that old ass logo and like, and it was just this little cheap horror movie that took the world over and everyone was talking about it. And I was definitely caught up in that hoopla you know it just it mesmerized me it was um nightmare didn't look cheap That's no like, not at all but it was che- you know compared to other movies it didn't look cheap at all dude but it was god you watch some of the documentaries you know freddy's makeup freddy's in the dark so much too because they didn't want you to see him too much but the makeup's like a little different from scene to scene but it most certainly it was looked fucking awesome yes. which is why it, why freddy became such a monster hit yeah. it looked I mean, part two is still one of the strangest movies to make for like, okay, you've got this, you've got a franchise on your hands. You've got an ultra popular character. I give them credit for making two because it's so off the wall and so dark, dude. Like that movie's incredibly dark. Um, I'm a big fan of two. I like two. That opening scene with the bus and then the world just crumbles and the bus is on those stilts. I used to wait for that to happen every day. I'd be so psyched if our bus driver just like went off the road into the fucking, I'd be so pumped like, yes. But um, yeah, one and three are my favorites. I do, I, you know, I like four. Uh, four four is my, was my number one. I just spoiled my 31 on 31, but four was my number one. Um, I thought really? Wow. 
dude, I thought the kills in it were so original. I love the sucking face kill, the cockroach motel kill. Um, no, that's a good one. Um, yeah, I like four. It's not my favorite. Five to me is pretty, eh, whatever. Yeah. Six, two, I could take it or leave it. But I do like four. Um, yeah, the suck your face kill, the roach motel kill was dope, dude. Um, I think for me, though, Dark Freddy, you know, for me, like that's really what resonated so powerfully that like as, as three and four turned up the humor, I missed Dark Freddy. But I get it. That's what sold. You had no choice. If I was directing it, I'd do that too. You had no choice. You had to do that because that's what was fucking entertaining and amazing and awesome. Um, and you pull it off perfectly. Oh, to- yeah. Dude, you talk about the perfect casting, the perfect character. It all came together. You know, that's what happens with art. When it all comes together, something yeah. magical happens. And that's certainly the way England played Freddy Krueger. But, um, you know, this is a preference thing. I prefer uh, this is God over, <laughs> uh, you know, Roach Motel. They check in. But they can't check out. You know, I personally prefer Dark or Gary or Freddy. But, no, 4 is good. I do like 4. Um, I can honestly say when it comes to the Freddy movies and quotes, and this is something that I'm completely 100% honest about. I would play video games when I was a kid, and I'd get to a boss, and I'd beat a boss, and I'd be like, welcome to primetime, bitch. Oh, yeah, of course, dude. Freddy. You know, like, <laughs> Nightmare 3 was that. That was my go-to line all the time. Like, welcome to primetime, bitch. Like, that was I- my shit, man. I'm trying to get the, my, my man Steve from Devil's uh, Latex that he makes all those busts and makes this, all this incredible stuff. Yeah. I want him to make, like, go get a little, like, fucking 18-inch box TV, right? We'll have it coming out of the <laughs> wall with a mannequin hanging out of it with Freddy with the antennas oh, coming out of his man. head. And I'll, you know, I, like, in my I daydream about having Steve come here and build it as part of my movie room. Like, we hang the TV on the wall. And yeah. then, you know, with a, like a little thing that comes out so it's like f- far enough from the wall. But we have like the – I mean, he could do it. He makes everything. The digital wires coming out as the hands. But then having, you know, a mannequin, s- similar size, similar shape, blonde hair, head in the TV. Yeah. God, how sick would that be? That would be so be dope. Yeah, I'm, I love I steal that idea. Oh, please do. That <laughs> idea is up for the day. I'm sure somebody has that. It's just like – I mean, dude, collectors are – people have the coolest shit like if you just like scour up like what certain collectors have it's just blow your mind right and i have so quick yeah i actually um you know i'm not i can't even call myself a real collector it's like when i see something that uh, it's like oh i have to have that then i have that but there's people that have you know rooms and rooms and rooms just filled with the coolest stuff me and you would go there and not leave for six hours just like (laughs) oh my god oh my god oh my god you know, but I, I guess I'm a small time collector, but I do, uh, you know, I dig having the shit. And, you know, it's all, again, for the same reason that America Werewolf in London and, and movies like Friday the 13th and movies like Nightmare on Elm Street carry this thing that's beyond just the movie. There's a nostalgia there because we grew up with these characters, grew up with these films. It's really powerful. And I'm, I feel blessed, man. I'm so lucky that I turned myself on to this stuff because. It's such a part of my, like, life. I couldn't imagine who I'd be without this stuff. I mean, that's why I'm covered with Jason Voorhees tattoos and Freddie tattoos. I, it's, it's that important to me. Um, and, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's not hard to get me to sit here and talk about it. Right. Long because, um, but, shit, is there any more questions about American Werewolf in London after that hour break to talk <laughs> about Jason and Freddie? I do have one last one, and it was actually um, – I do a ranking at the end of every video, so I was saving it for that. But if you were going to rank this movie on a skull count, zero being the worst, five being the best, what would you rank American Werewolf in London? I, there's no question, dude. It's a five out of five for me. And I would, I would not hand that out lightly. To me, it is the – not just, like, the pillars of my taste, but I think there's a lot of, like, iconic things. And we talked about all this, this mixture yeah. of all this different stuff, but done right. I'm notoriously, I review movies, you know, not professionally, but here and there. And I've been printed in a few things and um, I'm pretty tough, man. Like, but uh, there is no question to me. It's a six out of five, dude. Somehow it's more than five. No, it's five out of five. To me, it's, it's, it's not just the first horror movie. It's, it's a top 
at, you know, it might be number one, honestly. I mean, it's right there. It's up there, certainly, with A Nightmare on Elm Street to me. It's just, it's a really powerful movie. What it did lack was a franchise player that could carry the sequel after sequel after sequel. It didn't have that, which almost makes it even more intimate to me and more beautiful. And I know we had American Werewolf in Paris, but I mean, I give that literally a fucking half a skull out of five. Um, but that's my answer. And I'm not just trying to go extra. You know, I, I, that's my real answer. Uh, with some thought behind it, to me, it, to me, it's as close as you can get to, to the perfect movie. That's awesome. Well, I'm going to give a couple shout-outs here before we end this. Um, I always do a couple shout-outs at the end. Yeah, man. Here on YouTube, follow O4Gaming. Um, on Twitch, we got MillerTime36. And then my personal favorite uh, horror movie podcast, if you're into the podcast, it's uh, Journey with a Cinephile, a horror movie podcast. You can download that at any podcast location. Uh, Josh, I do want to say again, man, this has been amazing. I know we came here to talk about American Werewolf in London, but – being able to have a conversation about horror movie, this is something that yeah, no, really a dream was, to do for me, man. Ken, you're too nice, dude. This was a lot of fun for me. Like I said, I've been looking forward to it all day. Um, I was out on a bike ride, hence my I could see like gravel into my my skin, <laughs> and I'm like, holy! I dude, I thought it was two o'clock. I look at my watch; it's three thirty, and I'm like seven miles away. I'm <laughs> racing home. You actually gave me like the adrenaline and the rush to get home. And then I make it home like, oh, duh, it was 4.30, not 4 o'clock. Okay, good. Thank God. Um, but I was looking forward to this all day. And, uh, you know, we'll have to get on and do it again, man. You're a scholar and a gentleman. And I certainly appreciate the opportunity to get to come and talk hard, man. This is fun for me. So and I do want to put down here, we are going to have Josh's Twitter handle. Make sure you go follow him as well as the Coheed Twitter, Twitter handle. Make sure you follow them for any news updates about the band. Uh, right here is mine for Sledgehammer Horror. Make sure you go follow that. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Uh, Josh, I would love to have you on again. Another thing I'm going to start doing is where I have guests on, not only talk about their first horror movie, but I want to do a new segment where, say, we'll choose Evil Dead, the franchise. And I'll rank my favorite movies on that. You rank yours. We'll go from four to one. And then we'll see where we're the same, where we're different. I'd love to have you on to do something like that, man. Oh, yeah. Dude, hold on. Before we go, I got to show you this real quick. Okay. I, have the, I have this. Oh, God. So I just sold. I have like a four foot like tall by five foot wide Necronomicon-ish thing. It's more like uh, from uh, Army of Darkness sure. Necronomicon where there's the different ones. But check out this like subtle little homemade um, Necronomicon that oh, I have hanging up my wall. That's fucking awesome. What's cool about this, too, it, this is from a local artist, and he uses household items to make all this really cool art. He also made the big one. Now, I sold the big one because it's so big that there's just nowhere to put it, dude. It's like, I, you know, if I had a whole wall that I could put it up on, but it's like monstrously big. And quite honestly, a little cartoony for me. Now, I did just order the 16-page, fully inked-up uh, Necronomicon from Trick or Treat Studios. It was supposed to be here in March. Still not here. I've written email after email. No word back. Uh, at one point, I did get an email. And I'm not trying to rush them. I get it with COVID and everything. Yeah. But any, I, I order bird food. I get that. I order hummingbird food. I get that. And it seems like anything I order, it might come a little bit late. But, dude, this shit was supposed to be here in March. And no word from Trick or Treat okay. Studios at all. And I ordered two of them. But... Yeah, I have this cool little homemade one. And um, yeah, I just thought I'd want to show that. I love Evil Dead, obviously. It's a big part of, you know, all those. I mean, we could probably see eye to eye on a lot of stuff on, you know, like as far as just like tentpole, home base, love Evil Dead. But yeah. it'd be cool to get in some discussions about like which one, because I guarantee I feel differently. I talk to a lot of Evil Dead fans and I feel differently than a lot of them because yeah. one is my favorite one. But because of what it meant to me when I saw it, for the first time, like, as a kid. Now, I love to. Dude, do you know what an idiot I am? Do you know the first 20 times I saw Evil Dead 2, I didn't understand it was a remake of one? Really? I was like, dude, this is how stupid I am. I was like, why are they going back there? Like, <laughs> and I had this whole thing in my head. I just didn't realize that they would ever do that. I didn't know that that was a thing that they would remake part one maybe on some level that is kind of what i landed on but this wasn't confirmed there was no internet to look it up on either there wasn't really a community to talk to you know as a young kid into these movies me and my friend kawami were basically into these movies alone and 
you know, Kwam like would like live with me and we'd watch these and nobody else was we didn't have adults to run it by. It's not like the guy at the video store we could be like, now why are they going back? It's like, right. get the fuck out of here. I don't know. Um yeah, I, I kind of concoct my own story of why they were going back. And it was that Ash was actually possessed in like delivering more people to the evil dead or but it, that's it, just how stupid yeah. I was at ten years old. Well, it's funny, two things real quick. One, if you have not seen the Evil Dead musical, you need to go check that out, bro. Uh, saw it in person. Uh, got blood splattered yes. on me and Kawami. I brought my man Kawami, who, by, mind you, is, you know, like 6'5 five and 500 pounds. Big, giant motherfucker coming in trying to fit his ass into one of those theater seats. But we loved it. Loved it. That was Dude, good. I was, to talk about, man. It was so wow. good. It was so fucking good. Um, and so much fun, and God, I just, I could not be a bigger fan. I'm so glad you brought that up. That Evil Dead the Musical was, ah, Amazing. God, I wish what I could be in something like that. Um, it's funny you bring up Kwame, because uh, when I seen you guys for the first time back in 2002, something we talked about, uh, he was running merch for you guys at that point, actually. Mm -hmm. And he was the coolest fucking dude. Like, we went outside. Yeah, Kwame's dope. Oh, dude, he was such a cool guy. And I, it's, like I said, it's 18 years later. And the memory of hanging out with that guy is still fresh with me. That's the yeah, dude. You know, it's really funny because, you know, one day I'm like, we had no idea how to be in a band that was like a real band. We're talking, you're talking about a bunch of kids that were a garage band, you yeah. know? They put us on tour. I said, Quap, you want to come see the country with me in a van? Before I finished the sentence, he was in the van ready to go. And <laughs> we carried around you know and and we just were all like best friends out there just playing shows and Kwame became like an awesome merch guy because you know Kwame's lovable Kwame like anybody you know when he gets real tired he can get kind of brief with you but like ultimately Kwame's the most lovable guy on earth he's a friendly thoughtful caring yes. person and somebody I'm really proud to call you know one of my closest friends for my whole life i'm still friends with the same people i was friends with when i was six years old like we lucky. still hang out all the time um yeah i feel really lucky for that you know even even some of us that moved away we still talk to our friends from when we were kids and i think that's really special and um yeah me and kwame were the, the horror guys kwame has a tattoo of mount rushmore but it's Leatherface, Pinhead, Jason, and Freddy instead of the presidents you know it's it's as important to him as it is to me um, he was actually up last weekend and his nine-year-old daughter is telling me her favorite Jason kills and it just warmed my heart. You know, it's like beautiful little girl. She's like, I think in six, I like the kill with the happy face and the blade. Oh, going through. Like, it's so awesome, dude. But yeah, Kwame's a big piece of, uh, my life. There's not a whole lot of memories that become, you know, that are like tentpole memories that Quam's not a part of. And I, yeah. I love him, you know, forever. And, but yeah, I can remember watching Evil Dead 2 and like, I don't think either one of us knew why Ash was going back. We just didn't have the scope of like mind to be right. like, oh, they remade one. Even though clearly they remade one. <laughs> it's just, it didn't, that, that just couldn't even register to us. But that's why one is, is actually my favorite. They're almost like so different that I can't compare them, but Right. Well, we'll do that in the future. That sounds okay. like a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, Rock and roll. When, you, when, you, when you do talk to Kwame again, let him know that he's still got a fan out here from 2002. That dude is the shit. And the thing that I like the most about him is that, like talking with you. I can see that this is something you're passionate about. It's a lot of fun talking to you and you're enjoying it just as much as I am. And that's how I felt back then, you know, even as was this 18 years ago. So I was a 14, 15 year old kid. I felt like he was just as engaged in the conversation as I was. You know, it wasn't one of those things where he was just like, oh, hey, how's it going, kid? Get the fuck out of here. We sat and had a, you know, half-hour conversation, and that meant a yeah, lot to the kid. Hell yeah, dude. Well, I think, I think that's why, you know, people bring up, to this day, 18 years later, pre people bring up Kwame still. Mm -hmm. People are like, yo, how's Kwame doing? And Kwame was going to make uh, his own shirt for a while. He had this really funny idea. Um, <laughs> I don't know if this is like un-PC to say, but this is Kwame's idea. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> he's going to have a picture of himself on it, and on the back says, selling black shirts to white kids since 2001. That was his idea that he wanted to say. Oh, I, would, I would want a <laughs> copy of that shirt for sure. Well, because he was like, every shirt is black. Like, there's never any coke, especially at that time. Everything yeah. was very dark and marauding. And he came up. And then also, we were going to make a shirt that in, embodied a Coheed lyric. 
don't let him scare you with a picture of Kwame, but with the devil in Jersey City gang underneath him. Dude, and Kwame awesome. loved it. Yeah, Kwame was like a big – dude, honestly, like this might be an overstatement of sorts, but like sometimes I wonder, you know, the world – can be so finicky and so kind of sensitive about, I don't mean sensitive in terms of like things you're saying, like you sure. change one little butterfly effect. Butterfly effect. You change one little thing and maybe it doesn't happen. And I, I just tend to think that like, if Kwame wasn't there with us early on, that like perhaps things would have gone differently and we wouldn't be able to play. Like, you know, maybe the band lasted two weeks without Kwame there to help break the ice and to help laugh with us. And Kwame was a big piece of that early energy because it's not, it wasn't easy to, to everybody quit your jobs. We're getting in a van. We're going to yeah. try to be a band and we're playing basements. You know, we're playing, uh, we're on tour playing some shows, you know, there's three people there and we were happy to do it, believe me, but it, it, it isn't always the easiest thing when there's no money for a hotel and we're all sleeping in the van. And, uh, sometimes, you know, like Kwame included, you know, you're not in the best move when you, mood when you wake up in a 130 degree van on the side of the road, like Jesus Christ, it's so hot, you know. With five other have, dudes in there with you. Yeah, exactly. But having Kwame's energy proved, uh, you know, I just can't imagine it any other way. But people still, I think it speaks to the power of Kwame. Like people still, to this day, bring him up just like you did. Like people bring him up, like, and pretty often. Like it's yeah. not like it's that few and far between, but. Kwame's a really special guy. Damn, he should have made those shirts. So black agree. shirts to white kids. I love that. That is hilarious, dude. I want to um, one more thing before we get off here. And this is something that happened. This is something that happened with me and Josh. Uh, you guys didn't see this, actually. Um, I was explaining to Josh about how my mom was a huge Coheed fan. I lost my mom last year. I'm actually dedicating this episode to my mom because she would be so proud of what's going on right now. And I was showing Josh. My mom was a big fan of hummingbirds. And I got a tattoo of a hummingbird for my mom. And right as I'm telling Josh this story, a hummingbird came to his back window. And we're talking about signs and butterfly effects and stuff. And that, to me, was just my mom's way of saying that she's here, she's proud. And everybody watching, thank you so much. This means so much to me, Josh. It means the world to me. Like I said, you're one of my heroes growing up, man. Uh, because of you, I tried to hit the hi-hat with my left hand instead of crossing over with my right. You know, so I would sit there and I would practice because I was watching the videos. I was like, oh, he does that. That's fucking awesome. And I couldn't flip it and do a left-handed kit because I already learned my roles going from right to left. So I couldn't switch it up. So, I mean. Well, I'm not left-handed, though, dude. I'm, I'm right-handed. I just play right. like a fucking weirdo because I have no idea what I'm doing. But I made it work this far. Yeah. I mean, shit. If they fire me now, the joke's on them. It's like, I tricked everybody for 20-some years. Fuck you, motherfuckers. <laughs> Played on oodles of records. But no, I'm right-handed. Dude, I was just a kid. I was, you know, 10 years old. Had never wanted specifically to be a drummer. So it didn't make sense to me to cross my hands. And when I sat down, I could play. Like, you know, I'm not saying I was good, but I could play. And my dad said, don't change a thing. If you, you can it. play like that sitting down for your first time ever, you know, I'm a kid. I can't even, like, reach the kick pedal, really. But I'd go, like, yeah. well, probably not quite that good. But in that realm, and I just remember the adults were really impressed. So, fuck it. I'm going to play how I play. And, um, you know, in the studio, sometimes I'll, I'll cross my hands. I just I look so stiff doing it because it's awkward for right. me. But, um, you know, that's the thing about music and about art in general. There is no right or wrong. There are techniques that can help you. Certainly course but if something feels right well then it's right you know people can play the same notes on the guitar and hold their hands and like in different ways and different techniques and whatnot you know right or wrong is kind of malleable in a way so that's the way i've always felt about it but i certainly appreciate the kind words ken you're you're a really nice guy and uh i can't wait to do this again i've had a really good time doing this. so this was this was as much fun for me as it was for you um, hopefully, because it was a lot of fun for me. I hope it was I had a blast. I actually don't want it to end, but I got to do the editing on it. I lost you again. There we go. Oh shit! Yeah, yeah my phone is a, my know. phone is about to die, and I'm also gonna poop my pants. Like a lot of my getting up and walking around is to try to hold back this poop. But I probably shouldn't have brought that up. But uh, <laughs> you know what? I'm glad I did. I'm a man of the people, ending. and I'm a, I'm an honest man. Yeah. So this is it. I'm gonna go, and we'll do this again soon, Ken. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity, my friend. It means the world. Thanks, man. Take it easy. Peace out, brother. Bye.